Can I start you all off with some more stories? Is that fun? This is from May 16th, 2014. At Temple Square, last night, we had about a dozen Christians from five different churches witnessing. Two of those churches are recent church plants. At any given time, there were a few conversations happening. It was a beautiful thing to see. A really kind Mormon man named Philip, who grew up in the Bible, uh, he came over, he was from the Bible Belt. He had questions about grace. If one is forgiven freely, or in his words, if you don't have to do anything, then what besides gratitude do we have as a motivation? Um, he, he said, well, what? in quotes, besides gratitude, do we have as a motivation for doing good works? He didn't think gratitude was a sufficient motivation. We talked about purpose and evidence, namely how works are not merely uh, an expression of gratitude for salvation. They uh, fulfill a purpose for which we're created and they authenticate the reality of saving faith. They're an evidence of someone's genuine salvation. Beyond mere gratitude, God made us for a purpose, to bring him glory and to enjoy him. And the ethics of Jesus cut deep through religion into the heart. Kingdom citizens keep most of their righteousness secret, but they still let their light shine. If we want to become the kind of people that Jesus speaks of, that is in the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, We need to be recreated from the inside out. We need to be forgiven and born again. Only then can the true evidence of salvation be shown at final judgment. We get this all by crying out to God as children for grace, all because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Philip agreed to do some follow-up via email. We often talk about how if you want to be forgiven, um, you need to receive grace by faith alone apart from works. But salvation by grace through faith apart from works doesn't merely solve the problem of needing forgiveness. It's also the means by which God brings us into a change of heart, whereby the fruits that are needed to show our genuineness are brought forth. So do we need to have our guilt canceled and the righteousness of Christ credited to us, yes. And do we need real fruit on our tree such that at final judgment, when the sheep and the goats are uh, sifted, we're uh, we're demonstrable trophies of God's uh, transforming grace? Yes. And salvation by grace through faith alone brings about both of those things. A spirited back and forth also with an atheist named Nate, and some atheist friends of his. I think their names were Dan and Ari. We talked about whether all good comes from God. Nate insisted that there was no good, no evil, no purpose, no right, and no wrong. Just biology, bags of water, and stardust. Dan, instead argued that agnosticism was tenable, but he couldn't shake his belief in objective beauty and objective morality. Dan and Nate insisted that religion and faith all come down to feelings, and that feelings and intuitions are not reliable. I argued that feelings and intuitions are necessary and inevitable, but not sufficient for a responsible belief system. I told them that Jesus was a thousand times more compelling than any religious figure in history. Also, Jesus fulfilled prophecy, and others had compelling eyewitness testimony of the physical resurrection. This is the kind of thing first century Christians pointed to to encourage the faith of others. Also, The epistemology implied by reductive naturalism, that means reducing everything down to the the physicality of nature, and reductive empiricism, 
doesn't explain our lived out daily lives of beauty and ethics and introspection. In other words, I like to say, we already live in Narnia. We walk around among intrinsically valuable human beings that have souls. And we have this idea we can't quite shake. We ought to treat each other a certain way and we ought to be treated a certain way. You don't get that from reductive naturalism. We already, in a sense, live in Narnia, in a, I'm, I'm speaking facetiously, in an enchanted universe, as it were. Uh, it's supernatural that we wake up in the morning and we even care about politics with the sense that people ought to be conducting themselves in a certain way. And we get uh, so worked up with outrage uh, or a sense of uh, moral cause. That's totally incompatible with reductive naturalism. And it's so odd that the, the people that are reductive naturalists in America tend to be so passionate about politics. <laughs> so I love to go right there as quick as possible, we'll just talk about it. I encourage them, these are the atheists and agnostics. Let's see here. Hence, they should live, they should, sorry, they should neither entirely dismiss non-empirical means of knowing, nor wholly trust them. I encourage them to read a good book defending the resurrection of Jesus and to prepare to meet their maker someday and account for their sins. I told them I appreciated that, we were, that they were willing to talk about this stuff. It's important. I'm so grateful for anyone who's willing to talk about this kind of stuff or even just have the patience to have a 10-minute conversation. This one's from July 29th, 2016. A young Russian man named Anton watched Randy, Randy was a friend, an evangelist, tonight talking to someone else. Randy was holding a stack of tracks in his hands. Anton came up to Randy and slapped the stack down to the ground. Randy was shocked, but he said this worked in his favor as those surrounding him had compassion on him. You never know what uh, a troublemaker uh, <clears throat> is accomplishing in God's plan. We had no idea until later that this had happened. We Anton made his way to the north gate where the rest of us were. <clears throat> I offered him a tract, and he complained that, quote, we were against the Mormons. He gladly explained that in his country, he's from Russia, Preaching was illegal as of a few months ago. I said, well, we live in a country with free speech and that it was unethical for Russia to deny basic human rights. He said he loved Mother Russia and that America was pathetic because of its problem with homosexuality. He smirked and he chirped. We beat the bleep out of our gaze. I asked him where he thought the universe came from, whether there was a God whether there was good and evil and where it came from. He said, who cares? You live, you drink, you bleep, you die, and then you go into the ground. At this point, I started rebuking him for being immature and wicked. I told him that he was created with a mind more capable than the world's smartest supercomputer. He was created for more than this. That he was meant to ask the big questions he was not a mere animal, that he was meant to know his creator, that Jesus would call him to account someday for all his sins at final judgment, that there was a heaven and a hell. He laughed. My brother Anthony, Anthony was a uh, very energetic, charismatic brother, who when he'd pray, he'd almost shout. <laughs> but uh, he was a genuine brother. My brother Anthony started taking over more of the conversation at this point. I'm so glad he did. I did not feel much compassion or affection for Anton, regrettably. But Aunt Anthony went on to supernaturally pour love on Anton. He, taught, he told Anton that God knew him and loved him, that God cared about him and wanted the best for him. Anthony kept pulling up Bible verses to share with him. And for some reason, Anton kept listening. I exited and conversed elsewhere, but Anthony continued to love on Anton for
for at least another 30 minutes. He said Anton ended up showing a more humble side. He listened and he opened up. God is good. I look back on that story and I don't, I'm, maybe I was too hard on myself for being sharp and direct with him, his, the way he was being. But God used both of us, did he not? That's a good cop, bad cop you're talking about. I guess so. Just a comment on that. Jesus was sharp and direct with people too. Mm-hmm. So this idea that he was only compassionate all the time is not true. There's many times you Tell me he wasn't sharp when he looked at the Pharisee and called them backbiters, vipers. Yeah. yeah and, and maybe so. God had put on my heart in the moment a holy rebuke. Yeah. And then maybe God had also put There's in the moment on the heart is proper. Uh, gentleness in Anthony's heart. Why not both, right? Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. October 19th, 2018. Temple Square last night, I had satisfying, rewarding, productive conversations with two Mormons. The second with jo- was with Josie, who was the most receptive Mormon I have spoken to in years. She was an older mom with six kids. We covered a lot of ground. We made great, great headway. I invited her large family over to have dinner with ours. She was eager to stay even longer and ask more questions, but it was so cold. She shivered into the night, no jacket asking question after question. She said, I live in a bubble. She was from rural Utah. It was like meeting an evangelical Christian was her opportunity to dump an accumulated list of questions that she had saved up. It seemed to me that God had already been working on her heart. Next week, October 26th, Patrick and I spoke to an agnostic lady named Erin or Erin, E-R-I-N. I I wish there was a different pronunciation of that one. (laughs) She was walking from her Goldman Sachs office. Her philosophy of life was that we were all here by chance, that life has no final purpose, and that the best coping mechanism we have for the ultimate meaninglessness of life is to enjoy relationships while we have them. I told her that God loved her, valued her, and offered a restored relationship through Jesus. She had questions about suffering, human nature, and hell. Unfortunately, Robert, a belligerent man that we have had problems with in the past, showed up again. So we had been coming every week for years, minus winter, and uh, there was a lot of advantages to that, and there were disadvantages too, because troublemakers who knew we'd be there would come and... uh, Wow, this is spiritual warfare at times. He disrupted our conversation with Aaron. He inserted himself and interfered, taking the conversation over, insulting us, monologuing at her, and stepping very close to her. He uh, he didn't have a sense of space. It was uncomfortable. I asked Robert to leave, and he refused. I was praying in my mind that God would redeem the situation. Afterward, he also aggressively spoke with Patrick. We asked Robert to step back. Patrick made it clear to him that he was harassing us. He then threatened to take a bunch of ministry leaders to federal court. Don't try to make sense of it. (laughs) And interfered with yet another brother's conversation. It was a good night, though. The brothers collected afterwards, and we prayed for those we spoke to. We also prayed for God to have mercy on Robert and to remove him from our evangelism. Other brothers were able to witness to some male Mormon missionaries. Others spoke to Blake, who owns a local car dealership. Others also spoke to an agnostic and a Muslim. It was a full night. Let's review some of what we've covered so far. Again, because you probably won't remember, but a small percentage of what we walk through, and yet we can cement things by repetition. Evangelism is, strictly speaking, verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and for the receiving of eternal life. But by evangelism, one may also refer to the activity one engages in with the imminent goal of sharing the gospel. <clears throat> There were two kinds of evangelism I spoke of, relational and stranger evangelism, 
Stranger evangelism is with someone you'll likely never see again. And relational evangelism is with someone you have a recurring interaction. Some conversational questions I have encouraged. What is your faith background? What do you believe now? Do you go to church anywhere? What are the biggest differences between, say, what you believe and the teachings of Christianity? Have you ever heard an evangelical give an explanation for that topic before? What would you say the gospel is? What is your understanding of the gospel? Have you ever heard the gospel summarized by a Christian before or an evangelical before? Has anyone ever shared the gospel with you? And then you can branch. If they say no, it helpfully provokes your heart to the reality that this person has to their memory never heard a summary of the gospel before. And you can simply reply, may I? And take a few minutes to summarize the gospel. If they say yes, you can simply say, well, what did they say? And try to get them to give a summary of what they understand the gospel to be and perhaps build on that or correct it. <clears throat> we also talked about greetings. Develop personal terminology for greeting others that is especially warm and familial to other believers and kind and welcoming to strangers. Ask open-ended questions that can potentially be reciprocated, aimed back at you, and this is to your advantage, both for getting to know each other and for opening doors for gospel conversations. We talked about a rubric for communication and evangelism. <clears throat> Let me see here. Um, listening. Asking questions. Uh, sharing and declaring. <laughs> Correcting and encouraging. <clears throat> In my view... The more you do evangelism, the more it's good to grow in all six of these. And God will give you different circumstances for putting the accent on one over the other. Patient listening shows wisdom, reduces tension, helps one ponder how to answer, and gives an opportunity to silently pray. In asking curious and probative questions, you can take pleasure in understanding the purpose of someone's heart, learn more about people who are image bearers, and therefore interesting, and find out if they understand the gospel, and you could show warmth and hospitality. By restating what another person says, you can show that you're listening, you can test whether something's meaningful, you can cut through rhetorical flourish, you can show optimism over the God-given value <clears throat> of language, and you can graciously improve upon another's poor communication. Today, we will cover sharing. By sharing, I refer to a gentle way of showing something to someone. It might sound something like, can I show you a verse from the Gospel of John? Or, have you ever considered? Or, may I explain that? This mode of speech offers something up for consideration. One strength here is an accent on courtesy. Listen to how Paul grounds the call to courtesy in God's mercy toward us. This comes from Titus chapter 1, sorry, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Remind them to be submissive to rulers <clears throat> and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. What an astounding phrase. Perfect courtesy toward all people. I don't know about you, but I read that and I think, I need more mercy and more grace just reading that phrase. For we ourselves, so let's stop there, 
for a grounding explanation here. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. So, firstly, Paul thinks that we ought to be especially kind, non-quarrelsome and courteous, because we ought to remember how uh, much of a wreck we were, and God was so good to us. But we can also infer here that a Christian is probably tempted to be quarrelsome, to speak evil of others, to not be gentle when it's fitting, and not to show perfect courtesy, precisely because the people we're interacting with are foolish and disobedient, slaves to various passions, full of malice and envy, hated, hate, hate, hating others and being hated by another. So these are the, the exact kinds of people that Paul anticipates that we're going to interact with, and he still insists on showing perfect courtesy. Again, I read this yesterday, and I thought, Ooh, I need more of that mercy, just thinking about how I have failed at times to do this. So, because God has shown us so much mercy, we ought to utilize communication strategies that show gentleness, that minimize quarreling and display courtesy. Consider four would-you-mind questions. Would you mind if I took a few minutes to explain that? Would you mind if I showed you a passage from the Bible on that topic? It's helpful sometimes just to have a Bible handy in your purse or pocket Bible or your phone. It's easy enough these days. But on the street, you'd be surprised about how willing people are just to stop, let you get your paper Bible out, put your finger under, and just slowly walk through a passage. It's not complicated. You're showing it. You help. Uh, we'll often ask our uh, neighbor here we're talking to to read it out. Would you read that out loud for me? If you think you can get away with that. Do you mind if I shared some reasons for why I believe that? Would you mind if I walk you through that for a few minutes? Sharing is not the only mode of communication available to us, but it is in our toolbox. At the end of the day, we are ambassadors. We are not merely sharing. We are also heralding. But we can have a general comportment proper for a citizen of the kingdom, reminded that we ourselves used to be foolish and malicious. Mercy has a way of melting the heart. As Paul say in Romans 2, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. As my friend Rob says, you wouldn't beat up a blind person. Well, that's who we're talking to, spiritually blind people. Just a note on the power of the word of God. What you have to share is powerful, even if it's just a Bible verse or a biblical gospel truth. John Piper once wrote this of books and sentences. I have often said books don't change people. Paragraphs do. Sometimes sentences. This may not be fair to books since paragraphs find their way to us through books and they often gain their peculiar power because of the context they have in the book. But the point remains, one sentence or paragraph may lodge itself so powerfully in our mind that its effect is enormous when all else is forgotten. If this is true of good books by Jonathan Edwards and C.S. Lewis, then how much more God breathed scripture. God saves people by sending people to share the word of God. They hear, with, they hear the word with faith. And often that word is just one verse. Perhaps just a sentence or even a clause in a sentence. I remember hearing of a man um, who was saved on the beach because some lady passed by and looked at him and said, 
you need Jesus, walked away. <laughs> and then just, just, just set him off on a journey. I know uh, more personally a lady, um, and I, I probably wouldn't say this. You know, sometimes believers say things, and you're like, oh, I would not say it like that. <clears throat> but she had a, a close friend, and she came over, and she said, if you don't repent, you're going to fry like bacon in hell. And I was like, man, I probably wouldn't say that. But that is like, that. I mean, I mean, God uses believers to share truth in sometimes fumbling, bumbling ways that we would not necessarily prefer. And God saves people through that. One helpful image for Christians is that of an unsophisticated pre-modern farmer. Imagine him with overalls and a straw hat. He has a bag full of seeds. He walks up and down his land and he takes handfuls of seeds and he indiscriminately throws them out. In many cases, he forgets where he has sown or even what seeds he used. But one day he comes back and there's growth. It is not due to his polish or his precision he scatters the seeds, and God grows the plants. Evangelism is similar to this. You do not need to be an expert. In this sense, you are not special. You don't need much training, and you do not need a charming personality. God has ordained to save people through the words of people like you who are relaying God's word. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This makes for a great prayer. Lord, please use the so-called folly of what I'm doing right now. <laughs> even in my weakness. Even in my awful mistakes, my nervousness, my fumbling, my bumbling, please save someone. Please, Lord, use your word. Show your great power. Paul goes on. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our job is to portray for Jesus, sorry, our job is to portray for people Jesus Christ as crucified. Paul wrote to the Galatians, who were nowhere near Jerusalem during the death of Jesus, likely many of them that were hearing this anyway, quote, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. It's Galatians 3.1. So how was that portrayed? Through words. Over time, presentations of the words and works of Jesus were packaged in the four Gospels. These were undoubtedly evangelistic. Indeed, the Gospel of Mark reads like a dramatic presentation. Have you ever picked up on that? And then immediately, and then immediately, it's almost like it was, a, it was a, a play for the teenagers to act out in the local church. The four Gospels are packed with evangelistic material. If I could give you one tip today, it would be to find yourself a good audio Bible and to use your car trips to work or to the grocery store and to listen through one of the four Gospels. Just pick one. And listen to it repeatedly for an entire year. Do it with the goal of knowing it like the back of your hand. To develop an ability to reshare its stories and to know the flow of the book. I did this one year with the Gospel of Matthew. I started asking the question on the street, do you know what Jesus said about that? Or... Do you remember when Jesus did or said, or straightforwardly, can I share a Jesus story with you? It's a fun one. Sure. Sounds kind of cheerful, delightful. 
This is a great time to have some fun. Perhaps share the story with some oomph, with drama and accentuation. Stop mid-story and invite the other person to fill in the blanks. Perhaps they have some background familiarity with the story. This way you can involve them a bit or see if they're paying attention. Or, and take this for what you will, share the story in an obviously wrong way and invite them to correct you and pause and prompt them to correct you. It's here that if you're a good storyteller or if you struggle with monologuing, well, here's your place to shine. (laughs) If they seem agitated or bored, you can wrap up the conversation. But if they're having a good time, you can just share another story. One string of Jesus stories I would share from the Gospel of Matthew was especially from Matthew's, Matthew chapters 8 and 9. Jesus had just finished up the Sermon on the Mount. He, he descends the mountain. And people say, wow, Jesus isn't like our religious teachers. He speaks with what? Authority. Now in Utah, that's a big deal because they think you have to belong to a particular church with a particular system of ordaining. And if you're not in that church, you don't have the legitimate baptism or legitimate forgiveness of sins or the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the authority of the words of Jesus to announce forgiveness on someone received by sheer faith is foreign. And so I love to prime people with stories that focus on the authority of Jesus' words and not make my point until we're done, all right? So I would ask people things like, um, here's just some questions I'd ask. And this helps if someone's got a, a, a background where they claim to be Christian, maybe. One of the four Gospels is your favorite. What would you say some of your favorite Jesus stories are? Or I, I, we'd get to a topic and I'd say, well, you know what Jesus said about that, right? Or do you remember when? Or I'd ask, what would you say was the primary way Jesus demonstrated his authority in the four Gospels? And they'd say, I don't know. Or they'd say something uh, lame or, you know, half true. And i say, huh. And i say, well, can I share a story with you? Say, yeah, sure. Well, Jesus comes down the mountain and they observe how much he spoke with authority. And then immediately in chapters 8 and 9 of the Gospel of Matthew, we have uh, examples of Jesus' dis- uh, authority on display. Now, the first thing that happens is that there is a, a leper, and he says to Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. Be clean. And so Jesus touches him, which is nuts, because yeah. he's a leper. <laughs> Jesus is a Jew. You're not supposed to do that. So what you would think in your mind is that, ah, Mm. Now Jesus is dirty. He is unclean. And that man's just going to go on being unclean. But the opposite happens. Jesus remains clean. And the man who is merely touched becomes healed. Right after that, a centurion, like a Roman officer, sins for Jesus. And he says, I have a servant who is sick to the point of death. Please heal him. And Jesus says, essentially, I'll come and heal your servant. And the centurion communicates, hold up, Hmm, hold up. I am not worthy to have you come inside my front door. Tell you what, I am a man of what? Authority. I know how this works. I've got people under me. I can tell them, do this, and they do it. Come here, and they come here. Or go there, and they go. Ah, Jesus, if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus was like, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. Here's Jesus is commending this pagan dude for having an incredible faith. And Jesus remotely heals the man 
All he has to do is say the word. Later, Jesus gets in a boat, and he is sleeping like a baby. And his disciples freak out because a storm comes, and it looks like they're in big trouble. And they say, Jesus, save us. Don't you care about us? And Jesus gets up, and he puts his hands on the water. No? No, no. I just did it to you. I just did it. No, no, he doesn't do that. What he does is he looks up at the wind and the waves, and he says, be quiet. Shh. Sip it. Have you ever seen a, a, a cafeteria full of like, like 200 young children and, and uh, someone has to get their attention and how difficult that is? Well, Jesus just looks at a storm and he says, quiet. And the whole thing goes utterly quiet. And all Jesus has to do is say the word. He rebukes the disciples and then he talks to so, Of so much little faith. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he gets to the other side and he encounters two men who are full of demons. And the demons know who Jesus is and they say, uh oh, we know who you are. You're the Son of God. Have you come to torment us before the appointed time? They're, they're terrified of Jesus. And they say, and, I, and I, I just confess here, I have no idea what's going on in this part of it. They say, tell you what, um, send us into those pigs. <laughs> I don't know why. And Jesus just says, go. And thousands of demons leave these two men. And they go rushing into these pigs who then go rushing down into, I think, a lake. And they drown, mystifying. And it throws everyone off. And the townspeople ask Jesus to leave. (laughs) But there's a theme here. With the centurion's servant, all Jesus had to do to heal him was say the word. All Jesus had to do to command nature was to say the word. And all Jesus had to do to send demons running away is say one word. This also reminds me of Jesus calling Matthew to himself. There's that kind of supernatural call that happens. Who, who uh, is at their booth? And some scholars like to think, well, maybe Jesus sort of prepped him for this event. and He kind of knew it was coming and you know, that now is his time. But the way the story runs is Jesus just approaches Matthew and he says, follow me. And Matthew just gets up and follows Jesus. Or think about the story when Jesus met Simon. Jesus just says to him, you're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Peter. I mean, who does he think he is? I mean, if if you want a a change of name, you got to go to a court and get a judge to sign it off. And you got to establish the new name with your community. But guess what? If Jesus wants to call you Bubba, he just says your name's Bubba. And he called him (laughs) Stubb. If Jesus wants to change your name, all he has to do is say the word. So I would share these stories with people on the street. I especially would enjoy it with young adults and youth, but even with adults. Everybody enjoys it. And I'm not being combative right here, am I? I'm not attacking you. Um, Maybe I'll call you to repentance later, but right now we're just enjoying the stories of Jesus together. So in Utah, it became, you know, it's, it's of special interest to them um, to have special religious ceremonies for the bequeathing of authority. So what I would do after sharing all these stories is ask, now, how did Jesus <clears throat> commission 
or send out with authority his disciples to go and preach and teach the gospel. Do you remember that? The very last paragraph of the gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you till the end of the age. So I would just circle back with my, my neighbor that I'm talking to here on the street. Well, let's just, let's just wrap it up real quick. All Jesus, if, if Jesus wants to heal a leper, he can touch a leper. But Jesus doesn't even have to. All he has to do is say the word. Oh, I forgot one story. It's a beautiful story, and it's such a good segue to what I want to share with you. There was an instance where these uh, men had a buddy who was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. He was lame. So they heard Jesus was in town, but he's like Justin Bieber popular. They can't get close enough to Jesus. So they put their friend on a mat, and they carry him. And they go up on the roof of the house where Jesus is inside. And I don't know how they did this. Maybe they went to Home Depot and they got some tools, but they they they, uh, removed part of the roof and they lowered their friend down. It must have been such a ruckus. All this stuff falling on people inside the house and an interruption of the teacher's lesson. Totally socially uh, cringe, right? What are you doing? But Jesus looks up at the men and the man being lowered, and he's so impressed by their faith that he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the riffraff in the back, Pharisees are dialoguing in their heart, they say, who alone has authority to forgive sins but God alone. And Jesus says, I don't know what y'all are thinking back there. You want to see a cool trick? (laughs) Or he says, really. um, What's harder to do or what's easier to do? I forget the exact wording. To say to a man, your sins are forgiven. Or to say to a lame, paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and walk right on out. So I give an example. When you were a boy and your mama said, do the dishes or clean your room, you didn't even want her to lay her hands on you. All she had to do to send you off with the authority to go do what she wanted you to do is say the word. Well, how much more is Jesus, the creator of the universe, able to tell a man who's paralyzed, son, get up and walk right on out. And that's all Jesus had to do is say the word. So this was a great segue for the gospel. I'll end with this. In, the John, in John chapter 5, Jesus says this. Anyone who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. The words of Jesus are able to cleanse you and Jesus has authority to forgive you because of what he did on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and his identity as the son of God he could heal a man just by saying the word. He could, cl- he could uh, send demons out. He could give you a new name or he could forgive your sins. So if you, and that's where the gospel would explicitly come in, primed by all these Jesus stories. If you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved.